Hi everyone, thanks so much for coming and it makes me really excited to hear that you know, fungi hold a, a place in, um, in society and, and in people's hearts and I hope that um, you'll really enjoy seeing the pictures and, and learning about fungi um, tonight. So um, all of the pictures that you see in this presentation were taken on our mobile phones and in, yes, here, here we go. Um, and in the local area. So just, this is just a snapshot of what is like right under our feet. So to, to express my gratitude for your attendance tonight, I thought I would hit you with some statistics. Hooray. Um, so this is sort of just a, a quick graph to show the um, proportions of things that have been named out of the total estimated um, things that are out there. So as you can see, these things are kind of split into uh, large things up the top and kind of small things down the bottom. So if you look at the proportions here, you can see that, you know, we th we're pretty confident that for most of the large organisms on the planet, we actually have names for most of those. So for um, for plants, out of the, the maybe 430,000 species in existence, we think we've named about 93%. For the um, animals, which are the chordates up the top and also the invertebrates down the bottom, we think there might be about 8 million species and that we've named about 25% of those species. Uh, and as you can see, most of the, the unnamed things are, you know, really small invertebrates. So yeah, things that are hard to observe. And when it comes to fungi, our estimate is that there might be between three to eight million species on the planet. Now that's a pretty big bracket for a guess, right? So we really have no idea. And of that, we think that we've named about 150,000, which makes up only about um, like two to 5% of that total. So the Australian biota is extremely unique and we, we know that a lot of our plants and animals are unique to Australia. So it's not unreasonable to think that a lot of our fungi are also unique to Australia. And why is it that fungi are so poorly described? Well, they're really small. That fingernail is mine and it's maybe just over a centimetre across. And you can see that you've got all sorts of different uh, types of fungi that they're, they're really small, right? They're, they're beautiful, but they're tiny and really hard to see. Um, they're ephemeral. So this could be the same specimen at 6 a.m., 9 a.m. and 12 p.m. And then at about 12.30, it's just a pile of black goop on the ground. So they don't last very long. And they're also really variable. So this bottom row here, believe it or not, they're all the same species. And Michael will tell you in his talk later about how we know that. But as you can see, it's really difficult to tell just based on what things look like. Um, yeah, so all of these things contribute to the fact that fungi are really poorly described. Um, and here in Australia, a lot of our species are named after northern hemisphere species that look a little bit similar. And we go, oh yeah, that kind of looks like that. We'll, we'll call it that. Um, and at this point, it's also import, important to note that the fungi we see are actually just the fruiting bodies of fungi. So it's sort of like how um, a plant produces a flower. So for most of their life, fungi um, exist as mycelial networks underground where we can't see them. So fungi are really important in the ecosystem and that's something that we hear a lot, but maybe we don't understand the diversity of their roles in the ecosystem. So they can, um, they can adopt a lot of different lifestyles. So they can be saprotrophs where they hang out on the leaf litter and decompose um, material on, on the um, floor of the bush. Uh, they can be um, pathogens where they infect plants or animals or even other fungi. Uh, and they can, um, they can also exist as, um, uh, as symbionts, thank you, um, as symbionts, which is probably the most important one. So not great that I had a little mental blank there. Um, but that is, that's sort of the, the mode, that, the lifestyle where they um, 
are interacting with plants or animals or um, other, other parts of the ecosystem um, and cooperating and helping things to survive, be resilient and to flourish. So the way that this works, when fungi are symbionts um, in, in an ecosystem, as I was saying before, they exist predominantly as mycelial networks underground. So when they form a partnership with, say, a tree, the tree is photosynthesizing, so it takes, um, it makes its own energy from sunlight and provides carbon to the fungi. The fungi are able to um, process uh, things in the soil like nitrogen and phosphorus, which are really important for trees, but in the soil, the trees can't access them on their own. So there's this beautiful exchange between the fungi and the plants, where the plants are providing something that the fungi need, and the fungi are providing something that the plants need. So as you can see here, this is um, an example of a study that was done um, admittedly in you know, a single location with a single type of tree. But all of these lines here um, are examples of how fungi can actually connect individual trees. And the reason that this is important is because if you imagine you know, you're, you're in the bush, there's a canopy, like there's, there are some beautiful big trees, um, and then you see little saplings. But how are those saplings getting access to sunlight if they're all the way down here and the canopy is blocking out sunlight? It's actually because of these mycelial networks. So the older trees that have access to the sunlight are able to subsidise the younger, the younger trees through the mycelial networks. So they're actually um, providing sort of like a little, a little um, pathway for carbon and... Um, the exchange of nutrients so that those younger seedlings or, or saplings are able to grow and establish and um, be resilient in the context of an ecosystem. So 85% of plants, which, you know, is the majority, are actually dependent on fungi. Um, there are some um, exceptions to this. Uh, so carnivorous plants... Um, plant parasites, and also a lot of our native, um, some of our native plants don't rely as much on fungi because they're adapted to um, very poor soils. Uh, however, it doesn't necessarily mean that they don't rely on fungi, mm -hmm. it's just a little bit of a niche. Um, and of course, needless to say, there's possibly a lot that's undiscovered out there. So, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so there, there are lots of examples of um, plants that rely very heavily on fungi, and we'll show you a few more of those examples in a bit. Um, but first, I think it's really important to look at what happens in disturbed ecosystems. So this um, comparison of graphs here shows you what happened in a mine site in Western Australia when they looked at the fungi before and after rehabilitation. So here, um, you've, so that red line up the top shows you the, um, like the, the ideal kind of level of ectomycorrhizal fungi. So ecto means sort of outside and mycorrhizal means like, you know, they're the fungi that are associated with the, the roots. Um, so uh, ectomycorrhizal fungi are fungi that are associated with the outside roots of plants. So they're native. And you can see that even after a long time, that, that abundance never really fully recovers. Over here, you've got the saprotrophs. So these are sort of like the, the weedy fungi that kind of hang out on the surface and, you know, they do really well by breaking things down. And you can see that that's sort of the baseline level in, in red there. And even after time goes by, you can see that the, the abundance of those species actually never comes back down. 
So this has, this has implications for our local bushland and for our efforts in bush regeneration and revegetation and maintenance of pristine areas and what to do about weedy areas. So these are all examples of fungi that you might see in disturbed bushland or, um, or even in bushland that's um, undergone regeneration or revegetation efforts. Uh, so these are all considered uh, kind of weedy fungi. On the other hand, all of these um, fruiting bodies come from fungi that are known to be ectomycorrhizal with our native uh, tree species. So a lot of them are associated with eucalypts. And I just want to point out that nominally, we call this Russula lenkunya, which is the indigenous word for little beautiful. Um, but it is also known as Russula clelandi. So remember how I was saying before that we'd talk to you a little bit about some, you know, some specialists, you know, some plants that really rely on fungi, and orchids are a prime example of that. So most, uh, most orchids that, like our native terrestrial orchids, um, they just, you know, they're a bulb, they put up one leaf and they're like, yes, I'm doing a little bit of photosynthesis, but actually the, the majority of their energy comes from the fungi that they're parasitizing. So if you think back how I was talking about how there's a tree, it's photosynthesizing, it has its mycelial network. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of exchange of nutri nutrients going on there. This orchid is just like, oh sweet, I'll use that. So it just hops on and parasitizes the fungus and steals some energy and then makes these beautiful flowers. And um, this one here, Cryptostylus hunteriana, it just gave up on making a leaf. It was like, well, oh, I don't need that. And some orchids take it even more extremely and don't have any photosynthetic capacity at all. So these have no chlorophyll. They don't make any of their own energy. They just steal all of it from, from fungi. And this is the Eastern Australian underground orchid, Rhizanthella slateri. And it just spends its whole life underground. So it has no chlorophyll whatsoever. It completely relies on fungi and also the tree that um, is the symbiont for those fungi to be doing well. And when it flowers, it flowers under the leaf litter and gives off a really bad smell. Like it smells like ammonia, it's awful. Um, and these coffin flies think it's delicious. They think it's the best thing ever. So they go under the leaf litter, they pollinate the flowers. Um, and then when this... Um, when these flowers uh, make fruit, it smells like vanilla and bandicoots think that's great. So the bandicoot comes along, they'll eat the, the delicious vanilla smelling fruit and they'll deposit it somewhere um, with a nice little packet of fertiliser. And if the right symbionts are in that area, that's how this um, orchid is able to re-establish itself in a new place. So you can see that in this network, if any one of those things falls over, this can't exist. So now I just wanna make you look at some really cool pictures. Well, I think they're pretty cool. Um, these are all pictures that were taken locally and again on our, on our phones. And if there are any experts in the room, thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate your support, but please just squint if any of the IDs are wrong. Um, so these are all um, guild fungi. So these all have what are called lamellae underneath the cap here. And that, they're the spore um, bearing surfaces. So that's how they um, release spores and, and reproduce. These are the wax cap fungi. They are so beautiful. Um, and there are actually a lot of species here um, just in our area that are unique to this area. And um, thank you, Ray, for coming along tonight. We really appreciate your support. And Ray, has, Ray and his wife, um, Irma, have done an amazing job uh, at protecting these fungi and um, increasing awareness about the incredible species that we, we have that are unique to, to our area. Um, yeah, but as you can see, they're an absolutely beautiful group of fungi. And um, yeah, we really enjoy finding them. So here we've got the, the broad category of non-guild fungi. So 
if they're spiky, if they're stinky, if they're, you know, squishy or stainy or leathery or weepy, they're probably in this group. Um, so I just want to point out Aceroe rubra is actually um, a native fungus. It also smells really bad. It looks like it smells really bad, and it does. Um, but it's actually one of the only species that was introduced to Europe from Australia. So usually it's the other way around, but this one went the other way. Pardon? Not necessarily, yeah. <laughs> So because, because the, um, a lot of plant material is, you know, transported around the world, it, it can be easy to lose track. Um, yeah, so these are the, the ascomycetes, um, and they're, they're the really, really small things that are really, really beautiful. Um, yeah, so we've got all sorts of different um, morphologies going on here. So we've got slimes, um, cups, discs, pins, flasks, and the bird's nest fungi over there are really sweet. Their, their um, little uh, spores look like eggs in a nest. And here are some that might be more familiar. These are the brackets and crusts. So these are more visible on, on dead wood that's lying on the ground in the bush. Um, and again, you've, you can see, like there are, even in this group, there are so many different um, morphologies. So you've got cushions, crusts, parchments, brackets and shelves. And here are some of the fleshy brackets. So these ones are sort of an in-between. They're, they're a bracket, but they've got gills or they do cool things. And this one here glows in the dark. So bioluminescence is still something that's being looked at as to why it, why it actually happens, because it's actually quite an expensive trait to maintain. So maybe there's um, a pollinator that really, that really likes lights, who knows? If you do know, please tell me, by the way. Um, so here are the earth stars and puffballs. So um, something, that's, something that you might notice if you look for these in the bush is that when it rains, um, raindrops fall on, on this part here, the round bit, and the spores will kind of puff out of that, that little hole in the center. Um, and it's, it's really quite an amazing thing to watch. And here are the earth tongues. So this is a, a fantastic group of fungi. And um, the, the ones down the bottom here might all look very similar, but actually they're all different things. Um, and yeah, they're just a really beautiful group of fungi. And um, we always get really excited when we find the green ones. We go, oh my goodness. And we take lots of photos. Um, and these, these here are an example of um, fungi that actually attack, or not attack, but they make their living by infecting um, larvae or um, like spiders or like just insects in general. So some of you might be familiar with the, the zombie fungus. So they actually produce compounds that changes the behavior of their host. So if you, if you see spiders, like huntsman spiders that have sort of crawled up a, you know, the bottom of a tree and have just died like that. And they've got this kind of pink fuzz on them. It's probably because um, one of these fungi have um, infected them and caused them to climb up, bite down, and then die there so that they can spread their spores. Um, it's, it's really quite an interesting group of fungi. Um, so these are all pictures that... Um, you know, they're, they're beautiful specimens, but they're ones that I kind of went, oh, I mean, I think I could ID them, but, you know, it's, it's sort of an example of just the incredible diversity that we have right here. Um, and, you know, if, if you ask three mycologists what, what species each of these things are, you might get about as many answers. Um, so it's really an area that needs to be um, looked at in more depth and by more people. And because, I mean, it's such an enjoyable, um, enjoyable thing to, to get into. So another group that I would really like to talk about is the club and coral fungi. So we think that these are a great group of fungi because they are just 
they lack consistent morphological features. So, you know, it's really difficult to kind of tell them apart when you're just eyeballing them in the field. Um, but also they come from the, the, diff the main branches of fungi, so the basidiomycetes and the ascomycetes, and they also occupy all of the different fungal lifestyles. Uh, so this one over here in, in the, um, uh, over that corner is Romeriopsis pulchella, and this one here is Claveria zylindri. They look pretty similar, right? Michael will tell you how we know the difference for sure, but I just want you to remember that. All right, are these the same thing? Does color help? One of these does not belong. Which is it? Nobody point at me, because that's not what we're talking about. <laughs> so this one here is actually what's different. That's Romeriopsis pulchella. The other three are Claveria zylindri. And Michael will tell you a bit more about that um, in his talk and how we know that that's the case. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna take you through a tour of the club and coral fungi. And as Ness has told you, this is not a coherent group of fungi. It's a whole bunch of things that just, they're either clubs or they look like corals. We settled on this group because during COVID, we were restricted to 10 kilometers from where we live. And we decided we're just gonna walk every single track and photograph every single thing that was interesting. And we've now got, I don't know, how many photos between us? Uh, 100,000, 60,000, I don't know how many. Um, but we hit upon this group because they're really interesting they're hard to find often. They're, they exhibit all of those characteristics that Ness was talking about. They're variable, they're ephemeral, they're cryptic. Um, and we thought they'd be a really good uh, group to investigate. So we began doing some surveys of these. And we're studying them because they're poorly known and because we just like them. And I think you can see why. These things are just beautiful. You find them in the field and you get down on your hands and knees and you just look at them and go, oh, that is awesome. Um, so what I'm gonna to describe to you is our pipeline, what we do to figure out which of these is what species and how we know that. Okay, so here's the pipeline. First, you have to find specimens. We've been working mainly in the Lane Cove Valley and adjacent areas. Um, and of course, finding these things involves a lot of crawling around in the bush on your hands and knees. Uh, and of course, when you do that, it also involves a lot of ticks and leeches and stuff like that. And uh, Ray is nodding his head there because un undoubtedly he's been leech food quite a lot, right? Um, so that's what we do. When we find a specimen, so this is Romeriopsis crocea, and the, oh, for those of you who know orchids, that's an acianthus leaf there. So the, these things are about this big, all right? Um, we photograph it in situ with a date, GPS, and we take general note of the environment. What trees are around? What kind of substrate? Is it soil? Is it clay? Is it moss? Is it leaf litter, et cetera, et cetera? We then sample some of the specimen and we photograph it against a collection vial. That helps us to color correct. It also helps scale because the yellow lid there is a centimeter wide. Uh, and we then store this specimen in 100% ethanol and that preserves the structure but also preserves the DNA, which is what we're really looking for in the end. However, to describe new fungal species, you need a physical specimen and often one that is lodged in what's called a fungarium. That is just a collection of dried fungal specimens that is curated by a museum or something like that. So we need 
uh, physical specimen. So we take a specimen like this, we press it between filter paper, we put it in a food dehydrator, we then paste it onto acid-free cards and we store them in little glassine envelopes about this big. The reason we did this is because when we were borrowing specimens from existing herbaria, they were invariably broken and degraded and damaged and they'd got wet or whatever. And so we think that this is a much more sustainable way of collecting and storing specimens and you can fit hundreds in a clip seal box about this big. So they're the archival specimens that uh, will be stored in ethanol and dried on cards. These are some specimens that are ready for preservation. And you can see from the dates that all of these specimens were collected about a year ago in this period that we're sitting in right now. Uh, you know, 1st of the 5th, 11th of the 5th, 14th of the 5th, 17th of the 4th. And I just want you to have a look at these things and just, they're beautiful. I, I actually don't really like picking them and storing them like this because it's like picking flowers and you shouldn't pick flowers in the bush. Um, so also just, just a, a thing, if you see mushrooms and you want to photograph them, use a little hand lens, a little dentist's mirror or something to look at the gills. Don't break them off and tip them upside down to photograph them because you're destroying the reproductive structure of the, of the fungus. So when you take these things and dry them down, they actually still retain quite a lot of their morphology and structure. So this is Romeriopsis crocea here, for instance, and you can see it's still got its orange color. And so we're pretty happy about this process for generating archival specimens. Here's another Romeriopsis here. This is another Romeriopsis. That's a Romeria. You can kind of tell what all of these are. And you can rehydrate these and look at their spores and do morphological work with a microscope if you need to. And as you'll see, we're going to have to do that. I'm a molecular biologist. I've been interested in DNA and DNA diversity and how that diversity translates into the enormous diversity of life on the planet. That's my jam. And so when I'm looking at these things, the first thing I want to do is get DNA and do some DNA sequencing. And DNA sequencing is now the gold standard for identifying species. But there's a problem with just relying on DNA if you don't know about the organisms that you're working on. And one of the problems with mycology is that it's not taught in any science curricula anymore and all the mycologists are dying. And so we're losing the people that know about these things. And um, as Ness has told you, we only know 3% of them and they're critical for plant production, agriculture, bushland, movement of, of plants across the landscape that's going to happen as a consequence of climate change. So we need to know about fungi because they're a critical component of ecosystems, as I'll show you in, towards the end of this, um, of this presentation. So what do we do when we get DNA sequence? We use a process called PCR, which you would know about because that's how they diagnose COVID. Right? And PCR is just a way of making lots and lots of copies of a particular gene. In our case, we use a gene called the internal transcribed spacer. It doesn't matter what that is, but you end up with a string of G's and A's and C's and T's. And when you get those, you can line them up. So you can see here, look, all of these specimens have exactly the same DNA sequence at this region here, but you can see there are some differences over here. But those three are the same. These three are all from Australia, uh, Dari Track, Twin Creeks, Upper Terry's Creek. This is from Ohio. And so even though they're the same species, they've got sequence differences that set the Australian variants of this particular species apart from the ones that are in the US. So this is what a DNA sequencing chromatogram looks like. Um, you know, they're very pretty, but um, this is what we do when we align the sequences. So each one of these rows is a different specimen with its DNA sequence. And this is Romeriopsis crocea. 
As I said, local specimens all have the DNA sequence, but it differs from the reference specimen, which was originally collected in Ohio, and that was the sequence that's loaded up onto NCBI, the database of all DNA sequences that we use. So let's now add in some other species in this genus of Romeriopsis, and this is what it looks like. So you can see we know it's Romeriopsis because all of these things here are pretty much the same. This is part of the gene that's highly conserved. Down here you can see all sorts of differences and you should be able to see that these occur in blocks. So here's a block here and that corresponds to Romeriopsis, mm, kind of subtlest, but we're not really sure. Pulcella, the blue one, is another block. Later colour, Flavescens, Crocia, two species that we can't put a name to. So you can look at these, but they're not very informative. What you can do is use these data to generate family trees. So this is the Romeriopsis family tree. It's been made into a circle because it's too big to actually be, you know, horizontal. And the interesting thing here is that Romeriopsis consists of corals, which look like this, and clubs, which look like that. And all of the clubs are on one side of the tree and all the corals are on the other. And then each of the blue arcs there, buff corals, blue, orange, brown, white, are all clustered together as well. So this kind of tells us that what we're doing is actually informative and it's telling us something about the identities of these species. So let's start with the known species, the ones that are really distinct and easy to ID. It's Romeriopsis pulcella and Romeriopsis crocia. Here's all of the Australian specimens. Well, not all of them because we've got a lot more now, but these are the ones we had when we generated this tree. And you can see that they, that they cluster with two specimens that are identified as Romeriopsis pulcella in the DNA databases. So all of that group there is all Romeriopsis pulcella. Over here we've got all the Romeriopsis crocia that we've collected and here are some crocia from overseas. Looking at this we draw the species line right here. What's this? Doesn't belong to either and it's sitting in between them. So already we know that there's something there that we can't ID or at least is not represented in the data, databases. So let's look at some other examples. Here are the buff corals. So there's pictures of them all up the top there. None of these match anything in the DNA database and depending on where you draw the line for defining species according to DNA, remember, you either have two groups or one out group and four groups that look as though they fall into separate clusters. So there could be five species here, we're not really sure. This is where we have to examine these specimens and do boring measurements of spores and stuff like that, which I don't actually know how to do yet, so. All right, so at least two and up to five species. Here's the brown corals. None of these match anything in the DNA database either probably four species. Here's the white corals. The reference sequences are completely unhelpful. And the problem here is that when people do DNA sequencing, they're often not experts in the things that they are sequencing. And so they name it something because it's convenient. They go, oh, that must be this. So have a look at this tree and you can see Romeriopsis kunzii, Romeriopsis kunzii, Romeriopsis kunzii, clearly they are not the same thing, but they're all named the same thing in the DNA databases. So this is just wrong. Probably three species here. And the clubs, the, this is the same genus, but in this case we've just got clubs instead of corals. Again, there are four different species identified by DNA homology. One is probably our later colour, um, but who knows, because that's a northern hemisphere species. Um, definitely this one here is a new species. 
because it doesn't match any morphology of any club or coral that's in any of the books and uh, it's also an outlier. Here it is here. You see it's very consistent sequence but really deep branching. Okay, so that's one genus, Romeriopsis. I could show you tree after tree after tree of all of the genera that we've looked at, but I'm just going to show you one. It's Clabulinopsis. And here, we're pretty sure that the names that appear in the literature and on Facebook and in iNaturalist are often correct. There's Amoena, there's Corallino rosacei, there's Fusiformis, and there's Sulcata. But look at these, one, two, three, four, five groups that don't fall within any of those. So there's at least five more species identified using DNA, and each one of those will have to be described eventually. All right, so let's just summarise this DNA data because I, I don't want to show you a lot of trees and it's all very technical and stuff. We've now examined over 15 genera of club and coral fungi. Each genus that we look at has multiple undescribed species. Um, and these are three that we've, you know, we, th we think are new species. And there's lots more that we could show you. Here's an example of another genus. This is Claveria. And the only one we can really reliably identify is this one, Zolingeri, which Nesh showed you at the beginning. All of the rest I've got CF here, which means, you know, they're kind of like that, but probably not. They're very pretty. I, you'll notice that both of these, if you put the DNA into the DNA database, both come back as the same thing, as Claveria fumosa, which they clearly aren't. All right. Romeria, another group, love Romeria. They're fruiting at the moment, or sporing, depending on what term you want to use. Um, and this is one of the genera that we're concentrating on at the moment. Uh, largely because some, there's some pre-existing work that's very good, done by Tony Young. Um, and nevertheless, we're still confident that there's lots of undescribed species in this group as well. And we want them. So we're currently working on this group. Simon was talking about citizen science. If you see these, please send a photo with a GPS or what three words works as well, if you know that app. <coughs> Just send it to us, and usually we will be out collecting them within about a couple of hours. Because, um, yeah. Um, oh, I should say, Ray, Romeria abiatina, we sequenced your specimen from the DAR, and it came back exactly abiatina. Really rare Romeria. Your specimen is the only one that I know about. Excellent. Uh, well, we, we've been trying to transplant these into the garden as well, and they don't really transplant that well. So, um, OK. So our results allow us to identify specimens to genus, but a lot of specimens are new species, or at least are not yet represented in DNA databases. And this, by the way, is a fairy circle of um, Romeria, probably Lorothamnus, um, you know, um, because you start in the middle and the mycelium grows out over time and it fruits at the edges. And if you look carefully, you can see a whole bunch of Corallino rosacea in the middle as well. One of my favourite photos. This is at um, Blackbutt Creek in Gordon. All right, so. Let's put all of these data on a single map. And this paper describes these data, and that is coming out on the 8th of May. Um, these are the local fungal hotspots. So this is the Lane Cove River Valley. The hatched area is Lane Cove National Park. The heat map in the background is the predicted number of specimens in any 100 metre square grid across this entire area, and the dots are coloured 
by the number of genera that we have collected in that 100 metre square. So, fuzz up your eyes and look at this. There are a bunch of hot spots. This is Falls Creek and Blackbutt Creek in Gordon. That is Sheldon Forest and Rofe Park in uh, Taramara. That is Brown's Field, which is an old volcanic diatreme in Warunga. And up the top there is Coops Creek. Both arms are one of them, which is behind the sanitarium hospital. You'll notice that there's some things that are in common here. All of these are southwest facing valleys. All of them, a bit scarily, are outside the national park even though we know that there's huge numbers of undescribed and quite rare species in all of these areas. Okay. So, our general observations, and you know, some of these observations are just us looking. Uh, I think we've done 250 field trips now, and we look at a lot of stuff. So, none of the hunk, Fungal hotspots are within the national park. Fungal diversity is always higher where there are no sewer lines in a creek. There are more native fungal species in more pristine areas. So if you see an area like this, which is Coachwood Gallery temperate rainforest, it will have high fungal diversity, except if it's been regenerated or weeds have been removed from the area because bush regeneration sites do not regenerate fungal diversity. We, at the moment, that is just a general observation. Today, I was at the Karingai Flying Fox Reserve in Gordon, and I walked through Coachwood Gallery Rainforest, lots and lots of fungi. I stepped underneath Rosedale Road into the next section, and suddenly all the fungal diversity was gone. The Coachwood Gallery Rainforest looked great, but no fungal diversity. Went back home, looked it up. That had been regenerated and had all vines removed, which I presume means um, um, lantana. The fungal diversity has not returned in 20 years. That's important because that fungal diversity goes hand in hand with the plant community that should be there. And you can replant these communities, but they won't thrive if the fungi are also not there. So that's really important. Uh, and we're, we're planning research to actually examine that question in much more detail right now by looking at pristine, regenerated, and weedy areas and examining the fungal diversity, figuring out what fungi are there and what aren't. Finally, just, again, a nod to citizen science. We have an enormous privilege in Sydney. We live in one of the most mega diverse regions of the world, and there are still really good pristine areas in Sydney, largely in the dissected valleys where you can't build houses. And it's a resource that we need to preserve but it's also a resource that we need to explore. Because Ness and I will tell you that if you go out and look carefully, if you walk slowly and you pay attention to the small things and you're curious about stuff, you discover things all the time. Every single walk we do, we find something new. So all of these photos, and like I say, we've got 60 to 80 to 100,000, we haven't bothered counting, photos like this, these are all taken with, within five kilometre radius of South Taramara. All amazing stuff, each one individually beautiful and fantastic. So, uh, just a few acknowledgements. Um, we're from Macquarie Uni. Um, my research is funded by the Australian Research Council and also the Centre of Excellence in Synthetic Biology. Uh, there's a bunch of people on the left-hand side um, who have provided us with um, locations of really cool orchids or fungi. Um, and if you want to be on this list, you need to email us or whatever when you find stuff. We're 
more than happy because, you know, you open your email and it's full of all junk mail. Oh, you know, do you want to buy this? Do you want to get that? I'm busy unsubscribing all the time. But when we see something that says, here's something I found in my front yard, what is it? We love that because you get a picture and you go, oh, yeah, we know what that is and we'll email it back. We do it all the time and we really enjoy doing it. So um, thank you very much and we'll take questions if there are any. Thank you. Yep. Ness, do you want to come up? Um, okay, so that's, that's an interesting question. So most people are taught that plants get water through their roots. That's not true. Plants get water through the fungi that are attached to their roots. And one of the reasons why that's interesting and important is because fungi live inside little tubes and when it gets dry, they can retreat from those tubes and the tubes collapse. When it gets wet, the tubes expand again and the fungus can move back into the tube. So fungi are naturally resilient to drought and I think you're right that the more mycorrhizal fungi you have, the more resilient you will be to, um, to lack of rainfall and, and drought conditions. However, you might have noticed that last year there weren't very many fungi around, certainly not as many as this year, and it was because it was really, really wet. Mm. And if the soil gets waterlogged, fungi don't like it very much. So, you know, swings and roundabouts, pretty much. Who knows? And also, no one knows anything about this. Like, no one. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have anything you want to add? I was just, um, I was just reminded when you were asking your question about how um, there are some fungi that specifically reproduce after a fire, for example. So there are conditions where um, you can observe fruiting bodies more readily or sporing bodies. Um, and it's uncertain at the moment as to whether that's because of what's happening to the, the plant symbiont. So like if it's because um, there's space available for the fruiting bodies and, and they take advantage of that or whether it's temperature that kind of initiates something. Um, but yeah, it's, it really is um, quite an unexplored area. So really good question. Or, or whether the fungus is going, oh, my plant is dying, I better reproduce. Yeah, right quick. Now. Quick, yeah. <laughs> reproduce, yeah. Yep. Um, I think there was a question down the back there, yeah. So that, that's something that we're really excited about um, starting to understand, because um, I think if we were able to um, revegetate areas with native plants that are accompanied by, you know, a fungus that is able to support them and sustain them, that our, our regenerated communities would actually be a lot more resilient and stable into the future. So one of the things that we do know is that seedlings that are raised in a nursery, um, they have a different um, fungal uh, makeup that they, that they um, uh, start their life with. And once they're put into a regeneration site, um, not all of them do very well. Um, and we, we think it's, it's because those partnerships aren't quite right. Um, so I think somewhere that we'd really like to start is actually looking at ways that we can um, start seedlings off with the right fungal symbionts oh. so that when they are introduced um, or, you know, replanted, that they'll be able to do well and be stable and resilient into the, in, in the long term. So there's a, couple of, um, there's a couple of things to think about here. Often when um, people are doing mining, they will scrape off the soil and store it somewhere. That doesn't work for preserving fungi um, across the li lifespan of the mine. So when you spread it back, you're not spreading back the original soil microbial diversity. So what we need to do is to do the same thing as you would do if you were doing good bush regeneration, where you source seeds locally and reintroduce them to the degraded sections of land. But the problem is we know all the plants 
We know where they are, we know how to collect their seeds, but we don't know anything about the fungi. And we don't know, apart from this little graph that I just showed you, where the fungal hotspots are. So we need to be able to understand exactly what fungi are in these pristine areas and understand the hotspots. And then you have to do a series of experiments where you go, okay, do we really want to dig up a bunch of soil from here or some soil samples and then inoculate this bush regeneration site? And you want to do that in squares so that you've got inoculated, uninoculated, inoculated, uninoculated. And so you can then go back in maybe 10 to 15 years and look at the plant diversity in each of those and re-look at the fungal diversity in each of those treated and non-treated areas. So all of that is a very, very long-term um, project. Um, we're up for it, but, you know, it's going to take time to do. And largely because no one knows anything about fungi and soil. And the other, sorry, um, the other thing too is that, you know, if there are um, seeds that, seedlings that are planted and they survive and do well and become um, established trees, they won't necessarily have the mycelial networks to be able to support younger seedlings. So even if we had a generation of trees that was able to, to um, grow up into an established ecosystem, it wouldn't necessarily be able to sustain itself into the future. Hmm. Um, I think I had a question over here, right? Yeah. That's, that's a really interesting question. Um, largely, mycology was linked to agricultural pests and pathogens, so that once you get um, crops that are resistant to fungi, once you get treatments for the fungi of crops, then you start to get a decline in uh, what you might call blue sky mycology, which is just looking at fungi for the sake of looking at them rather than for, you know, growing a crop. Um, there are a few people who are interested in mycology. Um, Sophia is one of them right there. Um, but very rare. Um, and um, I'm not sure why. Um, because, I mean, I'm not a mycologist, but I think these guys are fascinating. It's probably the most interesting group of organisms I've ever worked on. So, um, you know. Um, but there is a renaissance in interest in fungi, and you see fungi mentioned more and more and more in, in mainstream media. Uh, things like Fantastic Fungi is a, is a really good film that, I mean, there are bits about it that I don't think are particularly scientific, but, um, you know, um, any publicity is good publicity, so. Uh, but we do need properly trained mycologists, and unfortunately the people who are doing the training are not teaching the, the skills anymore. They're going to have to be learnt from scratch, I think. Right. So what you're talking about is called taxonomic piracy. Mm. So there's a guy who's a herpetologist, a reptile expert, so-called, who jumps in, renames things, and he, run, he runs his own journal, um, and he's the editor, and he accepts his own papers, and, um, but because they're published, they make their way into the literature, and it just confuses everybody. <laughs> so, I think everyone in this room, like, you've probably come here, you know, because you have an interest in fungi and you appreciate fungi for what they are, but, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of working in science is also about working with people. Um, so, yeah. And scientists are pretty special. Yeah, we're a, we're a special bunch. Um, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, I think, I think one of the things to keep in mind is, is that if you've got a passion for what you're studying and for what you're, what you're working on and what you're learning, it's easier to manage the rest of the stuff. And I think it's, um, I think it's really important to keep in mind that there has been a lot of foundational work that people have done before us, and it's really important that, you know, we look at what's been done um, as we go in to, to do our work. 
But I mean, when we were putting in our, our application for a permit, we could not find a, fun a fungal section. Like no, we had to go into plants. We were like, what is this? <laughs> and I, I had a great deal of, because I kept trying to choose fungi from the list and they're not there. <laughs> they were in plants. Apparently they're, they're I mean, flora. I mean, right? fungi are actually more related to, to animals, animals than to plants. Yeah, they'd be better off in fauna. They but would be. Yeah. Be um, anyway. We've got a question here. Yes. <laughs> if, you, if you take... OK, so the first thing is that most crop plants have been specifically bred away from relying on mycorrhizal fungi. So what I suggest you do is if you ever see fungal fruiting bodies coming up in your garden, just take a photograph of them. Um, a good mobile phone photograph is more than enough and if you keep uh, like a fungal diary of those, um, what you might find is, well, you'll probably find the yellow flower pot fungus, mm. which is always cool, but it's, it's, very cool. But it's not native. Um, but they're bright yellow, they're very, it's good when they come up. Um, but, but we'd be more than happy to ID those for you if you just send them to us. Yeah. yeah, anyone is welcome to send us pictures and we'll, we'll have a go. Also, I just want to commend this lady's socks. They're great. They've got mushrooms on them. They're fancy. Uh, <laughs> I have ties to that. Oh, oh. That's fantastic. Oh, okay. Oh, do you? Can we see? How many people have mushroom oh, socks? Oh, that's great. That's awesome. <laughs> um, so, um, just before we go back to Ray, has anyone else got a... Oh, yes, just here? Yeah. Really interesting question. I'm not sure that anyone knows, but it's not necessarily about persistence. It's about... So, so think about a mushroom and it's releasing spores. The first thing is, dis thing is survival of those spores as they disperse and where they land. But when they germinate, the inn is already full because there's already a bunch of things living there. So establishment is the critical part of this, this problem of spreading, you know, native fungi back into undisturbed um, locations. So you'd see, see those two graphs of, of the ectomycorrhizal fungi and the saprotrophs. The problem is not that the soil at a mine site is no longer habitable for the native fungi. It's that there's a whole bunch of other fungi already occupying that site, making it very difficult for the original fungi to recolonize. So I know that doesn't quite answer your question, but, but the, the, it's not just about the survival of the spore, it's about where the spore gets to how long it lasts, which is the survival, and then when it germinates, whether it's able to colonise that new location. And that's the critical step that is missing. Yeah, it is. So, so there are guilds of fungi that associate with guilds of trees. So this is part... If you've ever wondered why forests are not mono, monocultures, that it's because of that. So you can get two species of tree that share symbiotic fungi between them and one tree species will actually subsidize the other during hard times for species B. We get a La Nina or an El Nino shift and it goes the other way. And so what this does, it damps down competition between adjacent different species of tree and allows mixed forests to be stable and resilient. But there are, for instance, the orchids have their own set of mycorrhizal fungi that are orchid mycorrhizae, different from... And so do the ericas as well, the Australian native has their own set. Um, and I imagine that grasses have their own set. And, you know, so, so... But, again, no one knows very much about this. And the original papers by Simard, who coined the term the wood wide web, to describe this mycelial connection was 1993 and not much has been done since then. That picture of the Douglas fir forest with the connections of a fungus called Rhizopogon, that's about the only additional kind of 
step forward that's been made across that across that time period. So, and I think that was 2020, something like that. So, you know, the problem is no one really knows. Yep. Really good observation there, because yeah. that's where it starts. Yeah. 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 Ray? So, so the, the point here is that, I mean, I guess the larger kind of viewpoint is we all, we all think we're separate from nature, like we're different somehow, but we're not. We're completely dependent on interactions with other organisms. And we see that as soon as you start looking, you see these complicated multi-species interactions where a fly, a mushroom, a moss, soil and whatever organisms are there, uh, a nodding green hood which itself is attached to another fungus, all of these things, you knock one of them out and the whole system can fail. That's exactly right. If you use an insecticide, knock out the fungi mat, yep. the wax cap can't fruit, and the nodding hood can't get pollinated. Yep. Can't get pollinated. Yep. If you have any more questions, please feel free to email us. Um, or we can we can give you a card. But thanks so much for coming and for Thank you. for your support and for enjoying fungi. Yeah.